continuing on with the discussion of ischemic heart disease and trying to create a differential diagnosis. This is part two. Uh, the first video we talked about myocardial ischemia, stable angina, unstable angina, Prinz metal angina, and uh, myocardial infarction, and some of the things that's happening, the uh, pathology behind it, and how it would present. Now we're going to be discussing pericarditis. So if somebody comes in and they have chest pain, um, we talked about could be myocardial ischemia or it could be pericarditis, it could be other things, but this discussion we're going to focus on pericarditis. So <clears throat> pericarditis, uh, you can kind of break this down and uh, itis usually always ref refers to uh, inflammation, uh, card is like cardio, the heart, and peri means around. So if this is a heart, it means you have inflammation or inflammatory processes uh, around the heart or in the periphery, it could be inside, it could be outside, whatever. First one we're going to talk a little bit about is rheumatic heart disease. So a rheumatic heart disease is a situation where a person has uh, pharyngitis, streptococcal pharyngitis, uh, and when they have this uh, streptococcal pharyngitis, the, the body ends up creating uh, antibodies to attack and kill this uh, streptococcus disease. But one of the problems is that the streptococcus ends up mimicking the, uh, a protein called protein M that's in the body. And so your body ends up making antibodies for the streptococcus, but at the same time, it's sort of accidentally making antibodies for proteins that we have in our body. And it ends up causing lots of pr uh, problems. <clears throat> um, one of the most common things that they associate with this is they, they have the Jones criteria. Okay, and they can actually use the acronym Jones to remember this. So with rheumatic heart disease, Um, one thing they help you remember this too is you've heard of rheumatoid arthritis. It's arthritis that's caused by your body getting an immune response to the cartilage like in your joints and things like that. So you think of rheumatoid, you think of rheumatic, this is your own body attacking itself. Okay, so uh, rheumatic heart disease, Jones criteria, J-O-N-E-S, okay, Jones. So what does this stand for? Okay, first thing that we're gonna think about here is gonna be joints. Okay. Sometimes it presents with some joint pain. Uh, o, and O kind of looks a little bit like a heart, okay? So when we look at the O, we think heart. Oh yeah, pancarditis. Pancarditis includes pericarditis because that's part of the pan, pan means everything. So the whole thing, including pericarditis. Um, N stands for nodules, okay? With uh, pericarditis, uh, excuse me, with rheumatic heart disease, <laughs> rheumatic fever, uh, you get these little nodules often. Um, e stands for erythema. Erythema. Uh, can't remember the exact name right now. Just popped out of my head. It, essentially, a uh, marginatum. Phew! Marginatum, I don't know how to spell that. And um, and last one uh, is also kind of a hard word to say, you have to look it up, but it's S. chorea. Chorea is like movements that are flailing movements. It typically happens in the chin and the eyes or upper extremities. Um, it sounds like, uh, well, no, you look it up. So that's the general idea here, is the Jones criteria can help you kind of figure out whether or not this is a case of rheumatic heart disease. But <clears throat> as I was going back and explaining what, what the, what's happening here, the, the body makes antibodies, so it's a type two hypersensitivity. The body makes antibodies that directly are killing uh, our tissue. This usually happens um, uh, 10 days or so, or maybe sometime way after the streptococcus infection is already gone. So the person's over the streptococcus infection, but now they have antibodies for their own, uh, their own body, okay? So 
after it's gone, they start getting a fever, you know, they get some of these other symptoms associated with this that I, we talked about, um, you're going to start thinking rheumatic heart disease. A lot of times it's in younger kids. Uh, but there's some other things that show up as well, and we'll talk about those. So one of the things that, that shows up is going to be, um, let me write down first of all, just to remember, Jones criteria. One of the things that's going to show up uh, is going to be, if you were to look at this under a microscope, you see in the person that they have these, these weird areas of uh, certain cell conglomerations called Ashkoff bodies, okay? Ashkoff, A-S-C-H-K-O-F-F, -F. I hope that's spelled right. Ashkoff bodies, and if you look inside the Ashkoff bodies, you'll see these little cells called Anitschkow cells, okay? Anitschkow, something like that. I don't know, it's spelled weird. It's not the language I'm accustomed to. It looks something like that. So these are Anitschkow cells in there, and they have this sort of, uh, called the caterpillar Cells, they have this sort of weird looking wavy nucleus that I think looks kind of like a caterpillar. Okay, so you see Ashcroft bodies, and Ishkow cells, you got the Jones criteria, you've got a past history of the person. Oh, yeah, they did have a streptococcus uh, infection a while ago, that's pharyngitis, and then that went away. It doesn't usually happen in the United States anymore because in the United States, when somebody has a uh, strept streptococcus infection, pharyngitis, uh, they go to the doctor, they do a little uh, swab in the back of the throat, like, oh, you got strept. Here, take some cephaloflexin, and the strep is gone. But in cases when they're when people don't have availability to antibiotics and they have a strep throat, pharyngitis for a long time, that's when this sort of hypersensitivity ends up developing, and then they end up getting rheumatic heart disease from it. So yeah, it causes pancarditis. The whole heart becomes inflamed. Sometimes these little vegetations can actually occur on the. Remember, there's these valves, right, in the heart, and these valves have these little like papillary muscles that kind of keep them closed and um, these valves can get vegetations on them and they can they can cause all kinds of problems with those but one of the really common things is for some reason the valve that's affected here with with uh, uh, rheumatic heart disease is the mitral valve the mitral valve if you remember is the valve that's located um, it's located, let me make sure you can see what I'm going to write here. We have room over here? Yeah, we got some over here. The, the mitral valve, this is not anatomically correct, but it's mechanically correct. Uh, right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. It's going to be the one right here between the left atrium and the left ventricle. This is the mitral valve. And this valve is going to get all inflamed and just distorted and messed up from scarring and tissue, things like that. And it's actually going to, they, they call it a fish mouth appearance because it, it gets so messed up, it looks like a little fish's mouth. And this valve ends up having, I believe it's regurgitation. So that means that when the left ventricle squeezes down and it's trying to push blood into the body through the aorta, Instead of the blood going all of the blood going this way, some of the blood actually leaks back this way through this little fish mouth valve, and the person ends up getting blood back in the left atrium, which increases the pressure load in the left atrium, and now their left atrium has to work even harder now to try to get the extra amount of blood back through there, so then they get left atrial enlargement. And they also apparently also will get, uh, I believe it's left ventricular enlargement as well, so their, their heart's going to get bigger, it's going to have all these problems. Uh, and, and associated with this is going to be pericarditis. So this is on your def, uh, your differential diagnosis. A person comes in with a chest pain. You ask, have you had a um, have you had a streptococcal pharyngitis? You know, have you had a sore throat, really sore throat in the past couple of weeks? Um, have you had? And you can kind of go through, and you can go through those Jones criteria, and then you can kind of know what kind of things to look for. So if a person has mitral regurgitation, I think that might present with an S4 sound. I want to double check that one though because I'm not positive, but look that up. So uh, those are some things to be aware of. You're gonna have unusual heart sounds, okay? Um, and you're gonna, if you look on a, a thing, you're gonna see possibly some some enlargement over on the left side of their heart, okay? So that's the first uh, part of this per, uh, pericarditis with rheumatic heart disease, but it could also be other kinds of pericarditis if they come in with chest pain. Uh, there are a number of different kinds. Uh, one of the other ones uh, that can occur with this is, uh, I mean, I guess you can even differentiate between acute versus chronic pericarditis. Uh, so you can ask, you know, how long, when did the onset, onset of symptoms happen? Has it been for been a long time? 
Uh, there's a couple different forms of acute pericarditis. One of them is called serous. Okay, serous. So serous, you think of like this proteinaceous fluid, and basically that's what it is. Is you get you know 50 uh, to 200 cc of a slowly accumulating fluid. Uh, it's usually going to be secondary to a, to a non-bacterial involvements, uh, and and they don't know why it happens. It has an unknown etiology, but around the heart, pericarditis, you get this buildup. It's usually supposed to be like nice, uh, non serous sort of fluid, not really thick. Um, but I guess when it gets to be uh, real thick, that can cause some pain in there. The heart's supposed to just be able to pump real fine without any sort of obstruction. Uh, you can also get fibrinous. We'll talk about that in a little bit more. Uh, or you can get serofibrinous. Uh, this is actually the most common. It's seen with uh, in the cases of myocardial infarction, and it ends up producing a friction rub. So normally, the heart's supposed to be kind of all lubricated in this liquid, but if it's got this this uh, serofibrinous um, debris around it, it's going to create a, create a friction rub, and that's going to that's going to hurt. Um, most of the time, it does resolve, though. <clears throat> so uh, you can also have a purulent, or also known as suppurative. I have all these strange words of these things. But uh, usually, this is going to be secondary to a back bacterial or a fungal or a parasitic infection that has reached up into that pericardium by some sort of a direct extension. So usually, um, the organisms that are going to be evolved here are going to be uh, gram-positive organisms such as uh, Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, or pneumococci. And um, you just get somewhere between 4 to 500 cc of fluid, and uh, it kind of organizes and causes this sort of constrictive pericarditis. So um, <clears throat> in, I guess we think about uh, infections that typically go into the heart. A person gets a staphylococcal infection, um, what usually happens with a staphylococcus infection is you get an IV drug user, most of the time, this is what, why it happens, and they want to shoot up some drugs, but they don't have any iodine or a way of cleansing this wound, they don't really care or think about that, and so they've got staphylococcus all over their arm, and then they take a needle and they push that staphylococcus through their skin into their blood while they're doing the drugs, and the staphylococcus goes in their blood, and it goes back, and it gets back to their heart, and now they have staphylococcus aureus, all over their heart, and uh, Staphylococcus aureus is a uh, really bad, invasive uh, sort of thing you don't want on your heart, and it's going to eat through your heart, and it's going to grow in little vegetations on your heart, and it's going to be bad for you. Uh, the other one that can happen is sometimes Streptococcus viridans. Typically before in sort of like really intense um, dental procedures and people who maybe have had some previous heart problems and might have some vegetations on their heart, uh, they'll give them a little bit of antibiotics. And the reason for that is because inside of your mouth, you have Streptococcus viridans. And Streptococcus viridans, when you start pulling teeth and, and blood mixes with the bacteria, that Streptococcus viridans can get in your blood and travel down into your circulatory system and get to your heart, and you can end up having Streptococcus viridans growing on the vegetations in your heart, which can cause inflammation and cause problems. It's not as invasive as Staphylococcus aureus, uh, but it's still not a good thing. Uh, another one that you can have is Staphylococcus epidermidis. That's usually in the case where a person has like an IV catheter or maybe a mechanical heart valve put in, and sometimes they'll actually accidentally get a little bit of Staphylococcus epidermidis on there, and that Staphylococcus epidermidis is going to then get in their heart and cause them some problems, um, some pericarditis and some other problems. Um, the other one is, uh, is Staphylococcus bovis. And um, bovis is the one that typically is associated with um, problems that have to do with your your uh, digestive tract. Like um, we'll go into a lot of detail, but if you think of if, if you if something about you know uh, stuff having to do with, with bowel movements and um, um, that sort of thing, then think of think of bovis. Okay, so I'm not sure of the whole connection there myself, but that's what this says on the the board rebook. Okay, so um, now we've talked about some of these different kinds of uh, pericarditis. Um, discussing now, we didn't really talk about fibrinous pericarditis. Basically, um, this is an instance where, or on the outside of the heart, if you were to look at it, if you were to take off all the layers that covered up the heart, you, were to see, you would see this kind of shaggy fibrinous exudate. 
and it covers the visceral pericardium. And this is actually the most common form of acute pericarditis. Um, normally, the heart will be all kind of uh, you're, you're shiny and glistening kind of appearance, but instead it has this sort of shaggy sort of, you know, because it's got, it's got fibrinous pericarditis around it. And um, <clears throat> it kind of makes it inflamed, and, and you end up getting this friction rub. And apparently you can even hear this friction rub on auscultation. So if you're to listen to the heart, you look it up, friction rub, you can hear it. Uh, you can find videos on that YouTube, whatever. Okay, so more acute forms of pericarditis in your differential diagnosis when a person comes in and they have chest pain, you're trying to figure out what it is, uh, is going to be, so we talked, this is continuing with the acute. So I'm gonna kind of list these up here for a second. You had fibrinous, you had serous, now you have fib, Rin or serofibrinous, is that what it was? I can't remember. Serofibrinous. Uh, there we go, something like that. Um, and now there's also hemorrhagic and there's caseous. Hem or agic and caseous. I apologize if I misspell things. Not the world's best speller, but I try. Hopefully you can read it. So more forms of acute pericarditis. So uh, hemorrhagic, it usually follows cardiac surgery or is associated with tuberculosis or some other kind of malignancy, okay? Something that's gonna cause hemorrhaging in there. So when you think of this, think of hemorrhagic, think of tuberculosis, think of cardiac surgery. This is where blood gets in there. Blood uh, is not as good as the fluid that's supposed to be around there. Uh, it's not the right stuff, but if you get blood in there, it's going to cause problems. It's going to cause pericarditis because blood's not supposed to be in there. It's supposed to be this nice fluid, that, like a lubricant. Uh, caseous. This is usually secondary to all such tuberculosis, and it's usually the direct extension from the lymph nodes. Okay, So very, very rarely is it going to be uh, mycotic or like fungal infections, uh, and that would essentially lead to uh, fibrocalcific constructive uh, pericarditis. But... The point is, is caseous, uh, caseous, you think of uh, casein, this is like a protein, and that can get around there. Same problem. All this is causing, you know, pericardial disease, acute pericarditis. Um, so a little bit more about the hemorrhagic. Uh, <coughs> sometimes you'll, you'll even get a little bit of fibrinous in there with it, with it as well. Uh, they call this sometimes a hemopericardium. Um, okay. Finishing that up, I think I got everything on there. Now let's go to chronic. Chronic pericarditis. So, chronic pericarditis. This is uh, caused by two bit main things you think of here, or three things actually. It could be the healing of acute lesions, it could be adhesive mediastinal pericarditis, or it could be constrictive pericarditis. Okay? So, be healing of some lesions, or it could be adhesive mediastinal pericarditis, adhesive mediastinal pericarditis, or it could be the constrictive pericarditis. Okay, so healing of acute lesions. Okay, this usually leads to the resolution of myocardial fibrosis, uh, which varies from a thick, non-inherent epicardial plaque, sometimes they call this the soldier's plaque, to a thin, uh, delicate adhesions, uh, to massive adhesions. So it can be all kinds of things. Basically, you get some adhesion occurring in there. There was some sort of lesion that occurred, and as this lesion resolves, uh, you get some you get some fibrosis some, and and it, it doesn't necessarily adhere, um, but it's basically an epicardial plaque. Okay, but this it's not supposed to be fibrous stuff in there. This is supposed to be nice, smooth, hard, and a sack of lubricant. And now you got this fibrous thing from this healed lesion, and it's rubbing, and it causes this chronic pericarditis. So it makes it when you get rubbing, the heart's going all the time, all the time, and it's not supposed to rub. It's supposed to be very lubri lubricated in there. And so any sort of thing that can cause it to rub is going to cause it to become inflamed and you get that pericarditis. And this is chronic. This isn't likely to go away. 
uh, adhesive mediastinal pericarditis. Okay, so the first one, the healing acute lesions, that was kind of, it was not adhesive. This one's adhesive. Um, this one's uh, clinically significant because uh, the pericardial sac is obliterated. So you've got this pericardial sac. So the sac is obliterated and the parietal surface is tethered to the mediastinal tissue. So if you remember, you have the heart and the heart is sitting in, um, I'm making sure that you can see what I'm doing here. So here's the heart. There it is. And it's sitting in this nice fluid. Okay. It's doing its job, doing a good job. And now this gets obliterated and this gets obliterated. And then these things basically adhere together. And, uh, and that's not good. You don't want that to happen. <clears throat> um, uh, this is going to result in hypertrophy and, and, and dilation. Okay. And it follows infectious pericarditis. So remember we talked about earlier, you know, things like tuberculosis or, you know, maybe purulent pericarditis. So you have some kind of infection in there and it's just really obliterated that, that, um, that, uh, uh parietal surface, uh, and, uh, per pericardial sac and now it's just adhesed together and uh, previous it could also happen in cases of you know if somebody had surgery in the past maybe they you know some kind of surgery to fix something that was wrong a valve or something and you did surgery and it healed poorly it just happens sometimes um, that could also be associated with this too or maybe a mediastinal uh, mediastinal uh, radiation okay uh, meaning that they did uh, radiation therapy on the heart. Sometimes that can cause some inflammation and things to go bad and whatever. Okay, so now the last one, uh, first type of chronic pericarditis, um, unless I'm missing something, uh, constrictive pericarditis. So constrictive pericarditis, usually this is tuberculosis, and most common, uh, being the most common cause. Um, this one is clinically significant because it has a thick, dense, fibrous obliteration of the pericardial sac, and often calcification, and it limits the diastolic expansion and restricts output. So if you remember, during systole, the heart squeezes down. It's kind of, you know, tightening down, pushing all the blood out. During diastole, it relaxes, and so it fills up with blood. Now, as it's trying to fill up with blood, if there's something in the way there, for example, a thick, dense, fibrous, fibrous uh, area, it can't fill up all the way. It's almost like it has, you know, hypertrophy. So it's like trying to fill up, but it's not hypertrophy. It's not muscular hypertrophy anyways. So it can't fill up all the way. And so that means that it doesn't have as much, as much blood in it as it should, which means it can't push as much blood out. So it's going to decrease uh, the amount of blood that it can push out. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to limit diastole expansion and restrict, it, restrict the output, decrease cardiac output. Um, in extreme cases, uh, you can get something called uh, concerto cordis. And this is where you can hear the muffled heart sounds and reduced uh, cardiac output at rest. And that, that's a really serious one. <coughs> um, so uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I'm missing on this one. I think I've got most of it. Um, I guess sometimes it can be so thick it can be up to three centimeters thick, this kind of scarred pericardium. Um, I think I've got most of it. So all right then. Um, now, after this video, we'll move on to the next section as far as a differential diagnosis of a person who comes in when you might think uh, it could be associated with ischemic heart disease or whatever. This was not necessarily, so it's not. So um, we'll move on.